Hi, I'm Jeff Ginter with Wheel Progressives. Welcome to MMT Mondays, Macro Mondays, call it what you will, I love alliteration. So this is our third installment of MMT Mondays. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the federal job guarantee with Pavlina Chernova. Uh, she's gonna talk a lot about not only what it is, but what it can do to the economy, how it can stimulate the economy. Uh, I want you to start thinking about labor in a new way. I want you to start thinking about UBI, you know, and how that is just so fundamentally different from a federal job guarantee because a UBI doesn't produce anything in and of itself because anyone that accepts the cash, you know, and decides just to consume and not contribute by producing anything, that's going to be a significant portion of the population. So we don't produce, we just consume. We become, we, we, we codify humans as consumption tools and not production tools. Uh, anyway, she's going to get into all of this. I just want you to start thinking about the differences between the federal job guarantee and a UBI. Economic justice versus consumption and consumption alone. What is inflationary and what is not? Which one is a better tool for price stability and guarding against inflation and which one is not? hope you enjoy it. I'll be back in a minute. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pavlina Cherneva. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, for the invitation to be here. And a special thanks to uh, Harvard Law and the Modern Money Network for organizing this talk. Uh, today, I, I would like to speak about a program that uh, basically hires the unemployed. How can we, um, how can we achieve this goal? As Annie was saying, many people today still looking for work. So they go to the unemployment office. You know, they ask for any kind of job. Private sector, social entrepreneurial sector, nonprofit sector, government jobs, and for many, this is just not an option. So what I will be making the case today is that the job guarantee is the missing option. It is the public option. Uh, for work um, that can be secured, and that is basically the next step to um, this long process of evolution of securing uh, basic rights, basic economic rights, and just to strengthening the safety net. Today, there are 54 million people who uh, benefit from Social Security, they use Social Security. There are 74 million people who are Medicaid, Medicare, and CHIP programs. Collectively, the direct spending, government spending on these programs is about 8% of GDP. Uh, we've got, how many? We've got um, 50 million kids in uh, primary and secondary education. Spending by states, localities, federal government on education is about 6% of GDP. So, Imagine what the conversation would be today if we didn't have Social Security, if we didn't guarantee Medicare and Medicaid, if we did not provide public education. If today we were trying to do that from the beginning, imagine what kind of conversation we would have had. Yeah, we would have probably said, oh, gee, it's too expensive. Right? We can't do that. It's going to bust the budget, absolutely no Social Security. And in fact, these were kind of the conversations even in the early years of Social Security. Social Security was declared bankrupt in the first year of its existence, and eight years later, we still talk about how it's not going to be there for us in the future. But it, is, it remains to be one, you know, it still remains as one of the most popular uh, programs that we have. So, by comparison, I'd like to propose today that there's a much, much easier task to secure jobs for the seven million unofficially, officially unemployed people who look for work. Or if we do a full count, that number will probably be about 14 million today. So how can we uh, do that? Part of the challenge here is that we have essentially normalized in our conversation, which is a highly abnormal situation. Part of the problem is, first, that we don't quite understand the monetary system. So um, this 
problem of not being able to fund our policy priorities is constantly uh, used as an obstacle to important policy uh, uh, um, uh, reforms. So part of the problem is just completely misunderstanding what it means to have a sovereign currency, what it means to have the public space, the policy space for the public sector to achieve its, its objectives. Another part of the problem is the way we think about the problem of unemployment. Um, and here, economists are, are the culprit. Last week, the Fed issued a statement saying that we see substantial underlying economic momentum. And Everywhere you read, you will see that the economy is strong, it's doing very well. Um, but if you just take the historical look, you will notice the blue line shows uh, real GDP growth and the red line is uh, employment, changes in employment. You will notice that we have kind of normalized a very unusual situation. Growth rates were much higher in the immediate post-war period than they declined uh, in the 80s. And today they're very, very anemic. And we know that growth just doesn't bring jobs anymore. But the paradigm I'm thinking is that as long as we crank growth, that is going to solve the labor market problems. And that just simply is not true. Um, so normalizing the abnormal looks something like this. You may have seen this chart, which says, how long does it take to recover lost payrolls with every recession? And since the 80s, it is taking us longer and longer, many, many more months to recover the jobs that were lost. Um, so, you know, like the black line is like 80, uh, it's 1990. The brown line, line is the, the recession of 2001. And in this last recession, um, it took us over 80 months to recover, 80 months to recover job, uh, jobs lost. So we're now used to what is called the jobless recovery. Everybody, you know, nobody blinks an eye. This is kind of the new normal. and. That new normal is creating underlying problems that uh, become more difficult to resolve the longer we tolerate mass unemployment. And in fact, you can make the case that the, the government chooses the unemployment rate. Uh, in economics, we talk about something called the natural rate of unemployment, uh, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, the NIRU. That is an explicit policy benchmark. Whenever you hear Federal Reserve discuss whether they should step on the brakes, whether they should add more stimulus to the economy, this is what they have in mind. Have we reached the level of full employment and or have, are we below it? And so in, in a way, policy, uh, the Fed chooses how many people will be out of a job. This is, you know, pardon the stock image, but this is the image that I'm thinking of. Now, this is what the labor market looks like. You know, people go to work, you know, they have jobs and then recession hits and lots of people are laid off, mass layoffs. And then little by little, you know, one, two, a few thousand managed to uh, get jobs back. But having an unemployment, a persistent unemployment rate, having a, um, a, a full employment definition be defined as some percentage of the population being without a job means that there are far more people that fall off the cliff than are able to climb up the cliff. So the NIRU means that, right? The definition of full employment that is used by CBO and policymakers means that there is a, some percentage of the population that will be naturally unemployed, okay? So, so that's what it means. We need to have more people than their actual jobs. So, Another way in which you could look at the problem of unemployment is to consider the following map of unemployment. This um, animation shows what happens to the unemployment rate, um, what has happened uh, during three recessions. There was a recession in the early 90s, there was a recession in the early 2000s, and then there was, of course, the Great Recession. So watch, just for a minute, how unemployment develops over time in the United States. As the first recession hits in the US, areas that have dark uh, gray are areas of unemployment between two and six percent. Those that are very dark gray and black are above uh, black are above ten percent unemployment too. So so while the national rate uh, in the 90s, peaked around 
you know, 8%, uh, there are areas throughout the country that persistently experienced above 10% unemployment. And as the economy in the 90s moved into the so-called Goldilocks economy, this is what happened to the map in the United States. This is the Goldilocks economy. So we are at the tail end of the Goldilocks economy. Here, let's take a look at the, um, at the 90s or the 98. Right? We're talking about you know, one of the uh, strongest economic booms, and yet there are communities throughout the country that have depression level of, uh, of unemployment, essentially. Then, in the early 2000s, we enter another, another downturn. And then we recover. We are now officially in a recovery. GDP is growing. Growing. It's a booming economy now. The underlying momentum is strong. So, so while unemployment rates after the Great Recession, national unemployment rates never reached above 10%. It was only one month in November 2009. It was for years that these communities experienced persistent unemployment. And so today, you know, when you ask people, you know, how are you doing? Uh, you know, uh, consumer confidence might be strong, but people are holding jobs that are part-time jobs that are poorly paid jobs. And so there's a, a large amount of essentially hidden unemployment. Now, if you, um, you gave it away, but so when you're looking at this map, how it evolves over time. There is another phenomenon that mimics this kind of behavior. What does it look like? Right? You've got these hot spots of unemployment, then suddenly unemployment spreads to a periphery. Then as the economy recovers, heals, right? the hot spots, the unemployment areas sort of clear out, but the, these core centers that have persistent unemployment remain. To me, it looks like a virus. To me, it looks like a contagion effect, like an epidemic. And I think that, um, you know, as economists, we can actually treat this as a public health issue. And there are many reasons why we should really be looking at unemployment that way. Um, it's not just that it is chronic. Uh, the Lead Economics Institute, we are conducting a research to estimate uh, mm -hmm. how many people might enroll in a job guarantee program uh, if it were implemented um, um, today. And we, we find that probably between you know, uh, 12 and 17 million people will. But the unemployment, official unemployment statistic is 7 million. I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, throughout good times and bad, we have millions of people that are out of work or seeking stable, well-paid uh, work, just above poverty. Uh, above uh, poverty rate. It's vicious. The unemployment problem is vicious. Uh, essentially, it's, you know, unemployment is like the scarlet letter. It's the mark of unemployment. Unem employers do not like to hire the unemployed. And this is the paradox of our economy where employers legitimately will say, look, we don't have enough skilled people. We can't fill the jobs. Uh, at the same time, there are many millions of people who are actually working for work. Um, we also know that there's a fair amount of poaching uh, among firms. Uh, they like to hire people who have jobs or have been out of a job only for a shorter period of time. The longer you are out of a job, the lower your prospects of getting back in the labor market. And there's that, uh, that little, um, uh, there's, a, there's a study um, that was conducted that if, uh, if an employer sees nine months uh, of unemployed experience or no work experience in somebody's uh, resume, to them that's an equivalent of four years of lost work experience. It's also deadly. Uh, this is not a hyperbole. There's a lot of research from the public health literature on this particular issue. Economists simply are not informed. Macroeconomists and policies are not informed by this, 
this literature. I have a paper again at the Levy website that documents um, the social costs of unemployment if you're interested. But essentially, we know that it increases mortality and it increases mortality. There's a permanent increase in mortality from spells of unemployment. Um, we know that, it, um, that uh, one in five suicides are related. Um, and it's a long-term effect, and it's very costly, not just for the unemployed uh, themselves. There are scarring effects, lo permanent loss of wages, family earnings, uh, permanent negative impact on social participation and social capital. I mean, these are the networks precisely that get you back into the job market. And once you're out of the job market, to use a famous phrase, you're not just bowling alone, you're not even bowling at all. Like, there's no... You know, there's no one you can see, you feel isolated, you, um, you, you lose your, your connections, your networks. And so these are the invisible costs that are very important in how people fare in the labor market. And uh, there are uh, increased costs of physical and mental health, costs that are borne not just by the unemployed, but their spouses, their children, and on and on and on. The economy, of course, uh, also bears some of these costs. Um, we estimate that uh, we give up 1 to 10 billion of GDP per day because we tolerate unemployment. So in a sense, unemployment is already paid for. And I'm suggesting today that there is a better way. We can simply redirect our resources to guarantee um, the right to a job. So. Um, very briefly, you know, if we use this analogy as an analytical tool that can inform what policy we might put in place to tackle it, we know that with epidemics, we're looking at increased virulence. Unemployment creates sort of unemployability, if you will. Um, and there is this, this spread geographical pattern um, to epidemics, much as we see with, uh, with the unemployment rate. Uh, we also know that there are vulnerable and distressed communities that are particularly um, hit by large unemployment. And that, at least in epidemiology, this is, they talk about an increased susceptibility um, to the infectious agent, which means that your body gets weaker when you experience of this virus. And it's the same thing with the unemployed. You, you become, your chances of getting a job, of getting a better paid job, are reduced by unemployment, all the costs that come with it, and the longer um, the duration of, of unemployment. So if we use this logic, we can then say that we can tackle this, this epidemic, if you will, uh, by identifying the source of the outbreak. Where are there mass layoffs? The Bureau of Labor Statistics used to collect uh, regularly data on mass layoffs, and we knew exactly the reasons why firm laid off people. They discontinued it in 2013, and I have to petition them to renew that source. But uh, we know, we, we see the map of unemployment. We know which are the areas that are, are constantly distressed. And we also know how unemployment is not experienced the same way by all groups. It is concentrated uh, among uh, people of color, uh, women, and um, the elderly. And so the intervention then uh, would be a preparedness response. Like we just simply need to have a way to provide jobs to the unemployed. Not wait for the crisis to hit, to see millions of people lose their job in January 2009, in February 2009. Not wait until it's too late, but to put in place a safety net, put in place a program that can capture people as they, come, as they become unemployed, um, to provide the necessary uh, stabilization. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the job guarantee and how it might be a program that is not just a cure for unemployment, it's a program of prevention, stabilization, and social economic justice. So what is the job guarantee? It's quite simply a public option for jobs, and the way uh, we're proposing it uh, at the Levy Economics Institute that this will be a program that guarantees a job at $15 an hour, plus some basic benefits. So when you go to that job center, that unemployment office, um, there will be a public option that will provide part-time and full-time options for work 
to accommodate people's different needs. It's a permanent program, kind of like Social Security. You can tap into it whenever you want. Well, Social Security has some conditions, but in this case, you tap into it when you most need it, and you exit it when uh, better employment opportunities um, are available in the private sector. It is uh, federally funded and locally administered. Federally funded because um, safety nets, guarantees, can only be guaranteed by the state. And in, in some ways, the, the state, the unemployed are already in the public sector. They are all, the, the public sector already supports not just the unemployed themselves, but the fallout of unemployment. It pays for all of the social costs associated with unemployment. So um, it is... Um, uh, it is a pitch to the federal level, but it is, it is a bottom-up program that is organized from localities um, and municipalities. It's voluntary employment. Nobody is forced to go in there. Um, we don't take away people's benefits to participate beyond requiring them to work for their benefits. It's just a choice. Um, and the kind of work will be uh, social useful work. It's open to all of legal working age who want to work, irrespective of labor market status, race, sex, um, or color or creed. Under current law, it really has to be open to uh, citizens, but I believe this would be a very useful program for a uh, path to citizenship program for dreamers and, um, and maybe even their parents. All right. So what it is not, it's not a compulsory <coughs> work fair. It's not a handout or make work, we're not digging holes and filling them back, back up, we are actually building stuff that our communities need, right? We are filling so, you know, social gaps. <clears throat> it's not temporary, it's a permanent program, it is that final piece, it's not the final piece, but an important piece of the, of the safety net. And it's not 100% employment, in other words, we're not expecting, we, it's, uh, it's not reasonable to expect that absolutely everybody should be working. Um, through the benefits package, uh, it's designed in a way to support uh, families that uh, have um, lack of access to childcare, and so they're not able to participate in the labor market because of um, uh, because of childcare responsibilities. But we also offer a part and full time option. So if caregivers would like to work a few hours, then they are uh, welcome into the into the program. Um, and it's not based on the NIRU. It doesn't target a specific number of unemployment. It's an open-ended promise that if you want to work, we will not say no. And it's not, it's, it's not just another infrastructure program. I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A, but infrastructure, uh, though much needed today and must be done, is not a particularly useful way of doing a job guarantee that it's permanent and it's over the long run and that provides jobs rain or shine, you know, in recessions or in expansions. Okay, so why? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's faster, it's better, it's cheaper. Uh, why is it faster? Well, quite simply, we don't have to wait for 18 months to restore the employment rate to where it was. It's, it's an option for jobs, so when people from Home Depot, Lowe's are laid off en masse, they can transition into an employment option, and that stabilizes in and of itself the labor market. Their spending patterns are very different, they can still go to the restaurant, they can still buy things for their kids, they can still go to the movies. Um, it's a very different dynamic than when you move into unemployment insurance which is rather small and is temporary. So it's a direct approach. It has an immediate res uh, result, and we make jobless recoveries a thing of the past. I've estimated that if we had dedicated the recovery budget to a direct job creation program, we would have created 20 million living wage jobs, wiping out unemployment altogether uh, at the time. And what we know from experience is that large-scale uh, employment programs, contrary to popular belief, can be up and running uh, in a re relatively short period of time. But because we're envisioning this program as a permanent program, I would certainly allow you know, a, a longer period of planning and, um, before it's set up and launched. 
it is a better stabilizer. This is a kind of a crucial point um, for the job guarantee. There are two options only. Our economy goes through ups and downs. That's what a market economy does. The stabilizers, there has to be a stabilizer. The current stabilizer is the pool of unemployed. Unemployment, as you notice, is very volatile. It shoots up very rapidly in recessions and gradually only declines. That is the stabilizer. We have, we have essentially deficit spending that occurs as a consequence of the evolution of unemployment. And that extra expenditure is the injection that is supposed to crank economic growth back up again to then result in the desired job growth. So job growth, jobs are kind of an afterthought, right? We are stabilizing the economy. We do pro-investment, pro-growth policies, whatever we think, whichever ones we think would be appropriate. And then we wait for growth to deliver the jobs. So the option is you either have an unemployed buffer stock or you hire the unemployed. You have an employment buffer stock. What you would expect to see is that this program will behave in the same way that unemployment behaves, except the amplitudes are going to be smaller. When people are laid off in recessions, they can enter into the program, and as economies recover, they can exit the program into better paying jobs. Just like at all times, there are always some people that are unemployed. You should expect that this program will always hire some group of people into the program. There will be a pool of employed. But the program in and of itself is going to be the needed counter-cyclical stabilizing force uh, for the macroeconomy. Why is it better? Because it has these other institutional features that strengthen the, the, the labor market. The fight for 15 is going to look very, very differently if we have a public option that guarantees a job at 15, that no one can fall below that. The private sector will have to meet that condition. If your employer that is paying poverty wages and offering awful working conditions, you're probably going to have to, you know, you're going to have to change them if you want to retain some of those employers. So the public option becomes the floor. And again, uh, while state by state we're going, you know, we're fighting for 15, uh, that doesn't benefit the unemployed themselves. So it raises the floor, not just because we establish a minimum wage for it becomes the effective minimum wage for the entire economy, but if we institutionalize Medicare as part of the benefit package, then that becomes the labor standard. Private employers will have to figure out a way to uh, guarantee at least that. So it is that institutional vehicle that you know we can talk about, like what should it guarantee, but essentially it establishes an above poverty package, policy package below which no one will ever fall. It invests in the public good. Uh, we'll talk about what kind of jobs and specific jobs, but this is a program that serves the public purpose. It is not a program that is going to you know, build cars and widgets, etc. It is going to fill needs gaps um, uh, in the community and um, work that the private sector does not do, does not have incentive to do. Addresses other social ills and basically is a program of inoculation. So guarantees a basic human right as outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's cheaper and I, I want to be very careful how I speak about this because we can afford whatever policy we want. The government has the power of the public purse. If we want to give an enormous tax cut, we will give it, right? If we would like to build uh, bridges, we will build them. The policy priorities are funded, no questions asked, government checks do not bounce. As long as the budget is appropriated, there are institutions that we have designed to make sure that all payments are made. When you get your social security check, it will not bounce, it is there. The issue is, what can you buy with that social security check, right? What are those resources? What ha Has the economy, is it working well to produce enough for the working and for the retired? And so when we talk about um, the cost of unemployment, I'm talking about the enormous social waste, human waste, um, the 
resources we allocate to emergency care, to policing, and other, um, other uh, uh, social uh, problems, the real resources that we're using for what we call economic, these bads, where we can redirect them to something that's productive and useful. So since we are already paying for this problem, um, the job guarantee is a way of paying for it by, um, uh, by sustaining our resources. But if you're really wondering about the cost, like how big is it going to be, it's not that big. In terms of GDP, um, our boldest proposal uh, is about 3% of GDP. Compare that to the earlier numbers that I discussed on Social Security, Medicare, and public education. It permanently reduces other expenditures, right? This is, this is a program that if it guarantees above poverty pay, means that people are not gonna be going on food stamps. And you might know how punitive this process is, the, you know, of getting food stamps and somebody telling you you can buy salmon or sending you boxes, right? But because that's what you should be eating. So the issue is that we guarantee the floor and eliminate the need to, um, to do these other welfare expenditures. We also estimate, we're using um, a macroeconomic model, um, it's called the FAIR macroeconomic model, and we estimate a permanent uh, real GDP increase of 500 to 600 billion dollars. Uh, a permanent increase of private sector jobs between three and four million, that we're talking about a permanent bump and we're not talking, we have not yet simulated the cyclical effect. So in good times, the private sector actually will create many more jobs, and in downturns, uh, uh, some of those people will actually shed jobs. And we also find that it has a negligible impact, impact on inflation, and uh, we're concerned with uh, looking at it, uh, reducing the invisible social costs of unemployment. So, for example, um, you know, a lot of former inmates have trouble getting back into the labor market. And the movement to ban the box, right, is fantastic. But what good is it if you can't find a job to begin with? So if there were employment opportunities for people who are most at risk, with greatest difficulty getting back into the labor market, then uh, we would expect great reductions on uh, incarceration. There's a program of as an anecdote, in Jacksonville that gives jobs to uh, former inmates. And they boast a recidivism rate of about 25% compared to 50%, which is a national recidivism rate, uh, and about 70% for young uh, people. What that means is that people reoffend or go back into um, uh, prison within two to three years. There's a very high uh, recidivism rate. With the jobs program, they've been able to have it, essentially, to cut it in half. And in the state of New York, it costs about $70,000 to incarcerate a person. That's two job guarantee jobs with benefits. So I'm not saying, you know, all, all, you know it will reduce all costs of incarceration, but there is a very important link between unemployment, poverty, and that vicious cycle that, you know, uh, leads to um, uh, incarceration. So we know that people of color in the labor market don't fare as well as others. This is just a very simple illustration to show that uh, they, uh, you know, African Americans tend to have double the unemployment rate of um, uh, whites. And among African American youth, we have constant and persistent levels of, of uh, unemployment, depression level unemployment, about 25% today. So how would we know, how do we know that this program would work and will help them? Well, we've had an experience here in the United States with precisely this kind of program. We had a job guarantee for young people in 1978 uh, called the Youth Entitlement, Employment Entitlement Program. And it ran only for a few years, but it did guarantee three years of work into this program. It provided part-time job opportunities to um, young people during the school year and full-time job opportunities over the summer. It was really, it's really quite impressive to study it because it was, there was a very high take-up among black youth. And what ended up happening is that re it reduced the differential between black and white youth. The employment to population ratios became e equivalent 
and they had a very strong post-program impact on wages. Um, it, you know, the, there's a detailed study of this, but basically this indicates that it's really shortage of jobs and discrimination that are obstacles for, for um, these young men and women. It wasn't that they are just not motivated uh, enough, and that's why they had a higher levels of unemployment. And interestingly, they transitioned out of the program. A lot of these jobs became permanent. You know, from apprenticeships, they actually became permanent jobs. So they transitioned sooner than what the guarantee um, was giving them. Okay. Um, let's look at women, care and work. This is no surprise, perhaps, to you, but um, women's employment varies with the number of children. Men's employment does not. So uh, while you, we have about 60% um, of employed uh, women have zero kids, with four or more kids, we have um, less than 30, uh, less than 30%. With the percent of employed uh, full-time men, basically stable, irrespective of whether you have one, two, three, or four kids. When you look at American attitudes to work, uh, people want to work, but for women in particular, caregiving is an obstacle. So they often like to work part-time. This would be an option for precisely those women that cannot find adequate part-time employment opportunities. Um, I will give you an example of the effect on poor women um, that comes from Argentina. Clearly, our context is going to be different, but this is a, a, was a very useful experience to me because the program in Argentina was, in fact, modeled after our job guarantee proposal that we developed in the uh, United States. And when it was put in place in the depths of their crisis in 2002, it ballooned very quickly. It became a very large program that hired about 5% um, of the population, 13% 13 of the labor force, and the vast majority of those people were women. 75% uh, were women, although the program was only for heads of household, uh, unemployed heads of household. So they enrolled in large numbers. Um, there were surveys, and I had uh, visited a number of projects. But basically, people were quite satisfied with, with this program. And I have an income was not the reason why they worked. Um, when. Um, when I visited them, we specifically asked the question, would you prefer to receive welfare or would you prefer employment? And without exception, everybody said that they preferred the employment opportunity. We also asked them, is childcare an obstacle for you to come and work in this program? They said that it, did, it was not because the program itself provided childcare opportunities for the people who worked in the program. The program was eventually reformed along the lines of a basic income program. And that essentially meant giving people a higher, um, higher monthly grant, but not requiring them to work. And the government had real trouble transferring people from the jobs program to the other program, Plan Familias. I can tell you the story. Um, eventually, they shut down the job guarantee, so people were just you know, naturally transferred to. But while the two programs were running in parallel, they ran a pilot in one province, and the World Bank went and studied it, and they found a very low take-up rate. Um, okay, and then what was important uh, for, for me was to see whether this program, in its short life, exhibited the features that uh, I've been discussing um, of a large-scale job guarantee program. It seemed to be counter-cyclical. It ballooned very quickly in the depths of the crisis, but very gradually those, um, those payrolls declined as people found employment elsewhere as the economy recovered. About 96% of those who found jobs elsewhere found those jobs at a premium above the wage that the job guarantee um, offered. And it did seem to have um, quite an important effect on these communities. Okay, so this is basically the survey. The reason why people want to work is because they can do something. Um, that they work in a good environment. That is from the HEFIS survey. Um, I have an income is 
the second to last reason why they were there. And I, you know, the context in the, so I was asked to, to talk a little bit about the job guarantee versus the basic income. I, I know it's a very hot and popular topic. So I just want you, I won't go into this too much, but just think about several key comparisons. The basic income program is an unemployment buffer stock policy, right? You can give basic income, more generous basic income, but private sector employment is still going to go up like this. And there will still be people who will be losing their jobs and getting their jobs in, with the cycle. So the basic income is not really a counter cyclical buffer the way the job guarantee is because it's provided at all times, right? Rain or shine. So it doesn't have this price stabilizing counter cyclical feature. There's also no uh, immediate and direct production of output. So this is a bit of an empirical question of whether people will just feel empowered from their basic income and go and become entrepreneurial and create a lot of new uh, product or services, uh, or whether there will be a good number of people who might opt out and drop out of the labor market, thus reducing production on that end. So, um, so that's uh, one of the questions. And the other question is the voucher program, essentially. That's what a basic income is. It's a voucher program. It doesn't in and of itself solve structural problems in the labor market or in the community. What we're doing with the job guarantee is we're guaranteeing income. We are providing a basic income, but we're also saying, let's produce something of social value. And so if it is the lack of childcare services that we need to provide, that's what we will do. If it is, uh, you know, water has not been monitored, we will provide the surveys and we will monitor the quality of the water. If it is some environmental projects that need to be done, we will do them. So it, we have a immediate social output associated with, with the job guarantee program. This is, um, you know, I was looking at what are the Americans' attitudes towards work and as popular as the basic income is, people just want to work in the United States. And they want to work not just out of necessity, uh, which is normally the refrain that you will hear from the basic income crowd. Um, yes, it is because they have to support themselves and their family, but they want to be independent. Um, they want to feel useful, right? 70% is a major reason for work. Mm. It turns out people don't hate their jobs. And the vast majority of people actually still like their jobs. They're, you know, they're probably things they can complain about, but they're mostly satisfied or completely satisfied with their, with their work. And the reason why they're not working is because they can't find a job. Okay, so how can we do this? I'm just very briefly gonna outline how I see this, what needs to happen here in the United States for this to happen. Well, I am thinking of a preparedness response. I really am thinking about the CDC model that has countless of warehouses through the country stocked with vaccines to be distributed on short notice on as needed basis. So the way I'm seeing this, we have these warehouses in the United States. They're called job centers. They're the former unemployed offices. And the only thing we need to do is to make sure that when you go to the unemployment office, the unemployment office is going to give you a list of options, private sector jobs, government sector jobs, nonprofit sector jobs, and public service jobs. And those will be proposed from the ground up. We, we will solicit from local providers um, proposals that will say, what kind of work are you doing here? In the Hudson Valley, you're doing some important environmental work probably short staff and underpaid. So we are essentially going to build the proverbial on the shelf jobs and uh, we will create a warehouse of those kinds of uh, opportunities. The funding mechanisms, the innovative part here is that it is going to be counter cyclical. Uh, I mean, this is really for the lawyers in the room and for the politicians to sort out how, how possible it is, but it is with disaster relief, that's what we do. We appropriate a budget for disaster relief, and then we fluctuate it on as needed basis. So this is essentially how you want to think about unemployment. You appropriate a budget because you know there's going to be you know, so many million people in this program, and if there's a stock market crash and you end up with like five more million unemployed, then uh, there has to be an appropriation that allows the counter-cyclical fluctuation to be able 
to allow the program to be the stable, the stabilizer, the economic counter-cyclical stabilizer that it needs to be. Um, all right, and who will do this? I mean, you know, we could do it multiple ways, but the Department of Labor seems like a natural place um, where we can house the program. Again, it will be a, it will have a budget for this, will be federally funded, but the way um, I'm seeing it and I've written about it is that it could be uh, run through the nonprofit uh, or the social entrepreneurial um, uh, ventures. The reason is the federal government doesn't employ people. Employment in the federal government is about 2% of total employment. Um, the nonprofit sector is about 14% of total employment. States and localities is another 14% of total employment. It's much easier to absorb workers in these places that already have the institutional capacity to hire and plus they are on the ground closer to the needs so they will be better suited in actually creating the jobs. Um, the way I talk about it is let's launch a national care act. This what jobs will these be? These will be jobs that care for the environment. They're jobs that will care for the community, care for the people. Um, we will uh, we will be um, doing the invisible work, essentially, that needs to be done, whether it is on environmental stewardship, whether it is species monitoring programs, whether it is a tree army, a modern tree army, or fire prevention um, um, efforts. I mean, we have countless of things that need to be done. Um, and we, we do lack of you know, affordable care for the young and the elderly whether it's meal on wheels or whether it is holding someone's hand in a hospice care, these may seem simple, but they're very important and they change um, uh, people's lives. So monitoring rehabilitation public investment programs. So let me conclude again with uh, what Danny was saying earlier that you know this, this is a significant step towards securing the Economic Bill of Rights uh, Well, we essentially guarantee the right to a job. But because of the way it's structured, because we also say that this will be above poverty uh, wage job, we essentially are securing the second, um, the second condition. Uh, a decent home, it just really depends on how the jobs are structured and what does that mean? You know, do we want some public housing? Would that be part of the component of guaranteeing the decent, um, decent home uh, Right. A medical care, again, there is, seems to be reasonable momentum for expanding Medicare. Uh, if that is part of a component of the benefits package, this is a very immediate way of expanding Medicare and providing coverage for millions more. And making it essentially a standard that has to be met by the private sector. And essentially um, provides the economic protection that we believe uh, we require. Thank you. So I know people might have one chem classes, but we have this room until like two. So we'll take questions as long as you've got them. Kate. Um, wonderful presentation, one of the best talks in my three years here at Harvard Law. Thank you for that. That's crazy. This isn't on the national agenda yet. Um, Quick question. Um, so I, if this got onto the national agenda, um, uh, I assume many people on the right who agree with it might try to corporatize it by saying, instead of having a public option, why don't we give, take all that money and Walmart can hire people, but the government pays their wages of $15, like the EITC is a bit of a corporate subsidy. Um, and then there's others who say, why have it just be $15? Why not build a bunch of public bureaucracies of a wide-ranging set of jobs like army bases and the like? And so I'm just interested in, in the how, if how loyal you are to these, the specific way that that money is spent. Um, and, and you got into it a bit at the end, but I'd be interested in that. Thank you. Yeah, great questions. So how loyal am I to it? For me, the key criteria of this program is it guarantees a job to the least fortunate among us. That's the key criteria. So then we have to ask the question, does infrastructure investment, is that sufficient to create jobs for anyone who wants and needs it? Um, the answer is no. Predominantly male, predominantly white. Uh, needs to be done without, without a doubt. Uh, but 
it is a program that fits in a way the job to the person because we are attempting to guarantee that right. I'd like to situate this program in the broader agenda, policy agenda, that attempts to do other things. You know, in and of itself, I certainly don't want to create the impression that this is the panacea to all of our economic pro uh, problems. But if we were to subsidize firms to do the projects, I would be very concerned because we might be perpetuating precisely the labor practices that already exist. They marginalize people, they discriminate, they don't hire everybody, they don't have an in incentive to hire at all. Our job is to, pro to provide a job for the person who is not wanted, but wants a job, a means um, to secure their life and their family's life. So um, apprenticeships are probably, a, you know, probably will be run through private sector. Maybe, maybe that's a really good idea to have some sort of private public partnerships for, for apprenticeships for young people. But in general, I would, what I would envision is if you have a very bold infrastructure program, um, it's kind of a green new deal program that will provide considerable impetus and growth that will create a lot of private sector employment. The job guarantee will actually be very, very small, but it will still be necessary to be there. So we can do various other things. Perhaps there is a strong argument to, um, you know, to, to provide um, bigger conventional public services, to staff the EPA appropriately, to get enough food inspectors, right? These are high skill jobs. These are areas of our life that are underfunded and that need to be supported, but the job guarantee might not be the most suitable way to do this. So the job guarantee is that it guarantees a job. Well, this is a stupid question, I'm sure, but what about the person who presses pressure off the demands of the job? Then you can inspire somebody. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not at all a stupid question. In fact, we, we have a lot of discussions about this. The way I see this is that Yes, you can fire somebody off the job, but you do it for other reasons. Then it gets unemployment? So you, you have to see what is it. If they don't show up, this means they don't really want the job, right? So if, if, if they don't show up to work, right, they just don't get paid. If a person is unable to perform the duties, like we measure success by, you know, have we weeded this garden, right? Have we cleaned up this space? If the person is not able to, uh, you know, to show up or has other reasons why they cannot really be effective on the job, we, the job you will provide the support. Maybe there's, maybe there's, you know, the opioid crisis. Maybe there are people that have, you know, drug dependency problems that would like a job, but they have other challenges and obstacles. Maybe it's childcare that they can't hold on to the job. Maybe it's transportation. The job guarantee thinks about how we provide the conditions for people to be successful. If somebody is security or safety risk, and I, I can use the example of a public library, right? If somebody comes in and is a threat to others in the public library, they're escorted out. Are they banned from coming back into the library? No, they're not. And so it doesn't mean that people cannot be successful at the job. So it's, it's kind of an aspirational program that, that attempts to provide the opportunities that we believe um, fit, uh, fit people. You know, they're, you know, we have to do it with people in mind. We don't want to expect them to do certain jobs that they cannot do. You know, if somebody, if someone is disabled but wants work, we're not going to put them to do a tool shed outside in the community garden. But we will have them do website work that will document and maybe catalog the work that is being done. Because there are many people who want to work, but the jobs are not there for their specific situation. Yes. Um, so earlier you were talking about how currently uh, when you're unemployed, it's really hard to get a job stigma that's attached to unemployment. So I'm curious uh, if you have any concern or if there are any ideas about how to mitigate the stigma that might be attached to people who lose their, get laid off and then spend some time in a federal jobs guaranteed job and want to maybe move you know, back to the sort of work they used to do or some other thing that's not you know, not included with the job here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think that this is a complete solution. It's, it's not a complete solution to this, this problem. I mean, but the way I see it is, you know, what is, by comparison, what is worse? To be unemployed or to be working in the federal job guarantee? And also, it's not clear. You know, if on your resume it says, you know, environmental work, yield monitoring, uh, et cetera, it, it's not clear that the employer will stigmatize you and say, ah, you're one of those people, right, from the jobs program. 
they will see what what the sort of work that is being done. I don't think it will eliminate the the problem altogether completely. And you know, when I was in Argentina, we talked to the government officials, and they had this kind of preconceived notion about those people that don't do any work. And then you go and look at the stuff that they actually do, and you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yes. Could you comment on age-related uh, opportunities and limitations, and then uh, uh, possible protections against seasonal abuse, where there are certain markets that in the summer have high demand for employment, or at harvest time have high demand for employment? Could you comment on those types of issues? Yeah. I mean, with respect to age-related employment, I didn't put this data in the so you can look it up in the Pew Research Center on attitudes toward work. People, you know, uh, older people experience significant and increased economic insecurity, increased economic insecurity. So they find themselves having to work. The way I would do it is I would lower the retirement age, uh, but the job guarantee will always be there. So if you would like, if you do not want to be you know, if you can't be, you know, just retired, but you would like to work in a community work, why not? It will not uh, say no. It won't turn a person away. Uh, with respect to seasonal work, I mean, that's part of the problem that we're trying to, to address. There are, you know, farms in the state of apple picking farms in the state of New York that hire a lot of people, and then those people don't have jobs during the winter. Same with, you know, some construction work. So this, this job uh, guarantee will will absorb some of that. It will have to be designed where some of this work can be offered on short notice. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, just some some small infrastructure stuff that can be delayed. You know, building tool sheds or cleaning up, you know, reclaiming materials, um, cleaning up lots, uh, public lots that, uh, uh, you know, some of this stuff can be timed. Some of it um, depends who gets laid off. I mean, you can easily shadow teachers or you can shadow nurses uh, and that would be very very quickly can absorb somebody where where you can get a job on short notice but it's it's more of a training on the job program right you're shadowing and you're learning what you're doing so that would be a very quick uh, way of creating what are exclude high school students so the way we model it is for 16 and above but I think it makes sense to maybe do 18 um, 18 and above this is more of a of a planning question there are a lot of young men and women who support their families um, presumably because there are no good jobs out there so perhaps it's not necessary to do this but uh, some sort of part-time apprenticeship program for high schoolers I, I see why not I don't see why not yes uh, great talk and really nice ideas I think I have two questions one is uh, how do we address automation? I mean, increasing automation is displacing jobs. Uh, so how does this program work in light of automation? And second is monotonic. People will say that people might become lazy as a consequence because there's always a job guarantee. Uh, so that might decrease private sector performance. So how do you address these two questions? Okay. So automation, you know, the way I think of it is there's no iron law that says that I can't create a job for a person who wants one. Whatever happens to automation, let the private sector automate. Some bad jobs really need to be automated. Great. 80% of our jobs is uh, produ reproducing labor. Like we, we serve each other, right? It's education, it is care, it is entertainment. That's it. And yes, you can, you can choose to automate them, but you can choose to have a person holding the hand of the person in the hospice care. You could put a TV there, but it's not going to be the same as care, right? It's the same thing with education, right? It's we design the jobs on the basis of what we value. So that's on automation. On lazy, um, I just don't believe in this paradigm that we have to make people miserable and we have to punish them to exist. Let them be afraid for their future so that they can be good workers. And I think that we can just have a better economy. Christy. Well, I think it's a really powerful argument, and um, so thank you very much for coming and laying it out. And, uh, in a way, my question follows from the power of the argument. Can you speak a little bit about the politics of why the pilot, pilot programs were dismantled? So what, you know, why do the politicians take part, either of these entitlement or the time deaths in Argentina? Yeah. 
Um, I'm more familiar with Plan uh, with Plan Hefes. It was primarily, I think, on ideological grounds. But I think um, the first step is why are they put in place? If they're not put in place in, as guarantees, it's very easy to remove them. If they're crisis resolution tools like the New Deal, like in Hefes, then um, the economy recovered robustly. They saw no need to guarantee con continued employment um, to others. Um, the program that exists today in India, the, na the, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, is the largest job guarantee program in the world, and it was enshrined into law as a basic human right. With all of its difficulties and their political challenges, it is kind of under a similar defund and destroy attack. It actually has shown some positive benefits on wages at the lower end, on environmental um, uh, some green projects, and on creation of assets for the poorest of the poor. So it is in law, enshrined into law. It's difficult to take away. It fills an enormous policy space, and they have to make it you know, workable. So it's very interesting to see how sort of the people who are trying to privatize those jobs and give them to the construction companies or to the privately run construction companies, whether they're going to win out in this, um, in this game. But, um, I mean, I think this is why, you know, the, you know more about this, the, the human rights angle is so important and how we push forward in this political context. You know, I, I don't know, but I, to me, it seems to be the, the fundamental premise on which we have to do this program. And then what I'm talking about is that this program, apart from being securing a human right, is a very powerful macroeconomic program. It is a structural program, kind of a transformational program. And so um, it, it is superior to the way we currently are doing things, even just on the macro merits. I love the idea, but I do see not a fault, but a weakness. Um, and, and that's the danger of starting these projects, environmental, caregiver, all generally involving people who are highly trained, and then the jobs come back and they go away. What happens to these projects? Do we let them hang until the next time? Downturns. Um, do they transition some people into permanent jobs to finish that work, maybe temporarily? How, what is the mechanism to, to deal with that situation? Yep. So <clears throat> the jobs that need to be done just need to be done. I mean, that's why I like I like to situate this program in the bolder agenda of securing strategic goals that have to be secured on an ongoing basis. So that is absolutely a necessity. In fact, I wouldn't want the job guarantee to be measured on the success of the jobs. I want them to be useful jobs, but I, it's not, um, oh, we don't want to lose these jobs. The question here is we don't want to lose an opportunity, uh, the ability to provide an opportunity to a person. That's the, the question is to guarantee the job for the person, not you know, the project itself. So because we're matching them, we do face this problem a little bit, right? You know, suddenly you have mass, mass exodus of teacher assistants because they found better jobs in the private sector. Well, if they... If the program demonstrates that free child care or teaching assistant care is essential and we cannot lose it, I would spin it off as a permanent program that will be there forever, and I will think of other ways to provide ongoing job opportunities for people to come and go. Yes. Yeah, uh, I would like to come back to that in numbers which you provide. 10 million of people in the United States, half of 10 million are without job as an unemployment, and uh, the influence to up to 10 billion of GDP per day, which is enormous figures, and which means that the one unemployed person influence like uh, um, $1,000 per day to, to, uh, to, to the GDP. And this program is great to, to cover this. Uh, my question is uh, uh, also, do you think that opportunity 
to increase the duration of uh, maternity leave for, for women will influence uh, the unemployment rate. So if uh, the woman will be able to stay home, let's say, three more months or even more, like in Europe, uh, will this influence the unemployment rate? Will the companies have a pool of uh, additional employers to uh, cover during this period of time? The same with vacation. So it's, in the United States vacation, it's two or twice uh, shorter than in Europe or other countries. What is your point of view? Okay, if I understood the first question, how is it possible for a small pool to create such a big real GDP impact? Is no, it, it's not just a constatation that it's like that. So, uh, uh, 10 million of unemployment in the United States uh, um, lose opportunity to have 10 billion per day of GDP. Ah, okay. Okay, sure, sure, sure. This is 1,000 per day, which is enough. At the same time, so the second part of the question. Yep. So, all right. Um, so, you know, we're, I mean, we are raising the floor significantly. We're, you know, a, a full-time job at 15 is $31,000, uh, you know, $31,500, plus we add benefits. Uh, so that is a, there are millions of people who earn below this. And in fact, the, there has been such an erosion of hollowing out of the middle income group that there are millions and millions of people who are at the, um, uh, below poverty, I and mean, the seventeen percent of working people are in po uh, live in poverty. But so, so um, we are really raising the floor, but we are also kind of stabilizing the floor there. So I won't get into the sort of the inflation impact, but the floor includes certain benefits, and that one of the benefit is I don't know if I mentioned it, but it's the paid leave benefit. I did. I, I think I had it on the slide. Paid paid leave, free childcare, paid. Leave. So there is. We have, we're the only country in the world that doesn't have paid leave, federally mandated uh, paid leave, except for two small nations. Um, there is a big movement to make paid leave from states to states. And New York passed, uh, passed it last, a few years ago, and California was the first. This is a very quick way of doing universal paid leave. But it's universal. You know, the man and the woman can benefit from it. You know, a maternity leave is, uh, it, it is, needed but parental leave is a, a better way of going about this because it allows the household to negotiate um you know who goes to work what kind of work part-time or full-time the pew research center on attitudes of work was if you look it up it's, it's quite fantastic they you know it's actually it's pretty awful i should say there is a question about um attitudes toward women working whether what's the ideal situation whether women with children should be working, and what's the ideal situation for the kids? They didn't ask the question, what is the ideal proportion of, of men with children working, right? So there's like a whole discussion about, oh, how women really ideally should be doing part-time work, and uh, but the question was not asked of men. The reality is women also hold these attitudes. So, you know, this is kind of a long legacy of, you know, how we see women's work and how we, how women have fared in the labor market. As women have entered the labor market, those attitudes have, have changed quite significantly. This is one very quick way of sort of stabilizing a floor for parents, families, partners, uh, caregivers that can then choose who's going to do the caregiving. Any more questions? Oh. Yes. Thank you. And um, so my question was when you were talking about Say someone was doing well and um, was volunteer job in the city, you know, comes to the one committee, finance committee, and they decide they're going to fill this volunteer work. It's turning into a lot of hours. Could they go to this employment office and say, I think this would be uh, a, federal, a federal job? Could they do that? Or would, I guess I'm thinking about it. Or, or would it be, you're going to have so the employment office, uh, the unemployment offices that we have now, would it be? Uh, 
Yes, thank you. So first, I should say, President Obama renamed the unemployment offices and they're called one-stop job centers. And they provide a host of, of uh, services and benefits from helping with your resume to um, uh, workshops on how to be more confident at the interview. Right? They do a wide range. One thing that they cannot guarantee you is a job. So I just propose that we really truly make them one-stop job centers where you get a whole list of options plus including the public option. The program proposal in my ideal world will be a bottom-up proposal where it will involve exactly all of these constituents, whether it is like a local committee that includes people from the city, uh, you know, people from local nonprofits, yes, community groups, the unemployed themselves. The uh, in Argentina, that's what happened. I uh, they had a, a a proposal where the unemployed themselves organized, and they have a lot of small political parties and organizations. Uh, the political landscape is a little different, uh, but they organize and they say, okay, what do we need here? We need a bakery and we have so many people that we can staff it with. And there was a channel from the bottom up that went directly to the Ministry of Labor to uh, propose these projects. I talked to a lot of people who work in the nonprofit sector and say, oh, I can think of so many things that we can, you know, we can propose for, for a job guarantee program. I mean, there is a little bit of an issue with the volunteer work and you know, some of this volunteer work um, is needed, essential, but not a very good way of providing that service on ongoing basis, precisely because you cannot guarantee the volunteer work as a consistent, you know, perfectly staffed. So maybe it is okay for some of those volunteer uh, people to um, um, convert their their jobs into their opportunities into paid jobs, and so you know I'm. I'm well, you know, I'm open to this kind of uh, proposal process. I don't think that it would necessarily reduce overall volunteering. You know, I, you know, we could still go and volunteer in our churches and our schools just because the job guarantee is there. We can still participate in the public library events, um, but it might allow us to volunteer a little more because some people don't have the luxury to volunteer. They just don't, like you were saying, they don't have the time. They don't have the income. They may want to. To do more. Um, so the impact on volunteering I think is a little ambiguous uh, but I, I don't see it being reduced in great numbers. Some of this work should be paid. All right I think it's gonna wrap it up. Please join me in thank you. Hi welcome back. So if you've been paying attention these last three weeks I hope you're starting to get excited about what you're hearing. I hope you're starting to get excited, not because the federal government can just simply pay for everything and just pay and pay and pay and pay and pay. No one is saying that. There are limits. But I hope that you're excited about what we can do within those limits. And I hope you're a little bit pissed off when you realize that we have been artificially kept from utilizing our resources for the public good and disguising it as the, well, it's too expensive and we just can't do it. So I hope that your excitement coexists with your anger so that it will spur you to action. Because now you will have what so few people do have. You have a plan of action. You have a direction to go into. That's what this is all about. Giving you information. Allowing you to digest it, assimilate it, and then activate on it. Go for it. Do what you have to do within your, within your communities. Talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors. You're a libertarian, great. Talk to Republicans, talk to, to, liber to, um, to liberals, talk to everyone. We have to start talking to each other. But there's no point in doing it until we have finally mastered the economy and where money comes from and how it is utilized and what our tax is for. There's no point in having these conversations until we know what we're talking about. That's what this is all about. Thank you for coming to MMT Mondays. I'm Jeff Ginter. We'll see you next week.